First off, thanks, you, thanks to all of you for joining today's webinar on BirdSmart Wind Energy. My name is Joel Merriman. I am the BirdSmart Wind Energy Campaign Director at American Bird Conservancy. Um, before we get this underway, um, I'd like to handle a little bit of IT logistics. Um, first, please note that all participants will be muted throughout the presentation to minimize any feedback and the potential for any accidental background noise. Um, if you have questions while we're going through the presentation, please feel free to write these in the chat box. Um, that should be in the menu at the bottom of your screen. Um, I will answer these at the end of the presentation. Um, so please feel free to put those in as the presentation is underway. And this webinar will be recorded um, and we will send a link to that um, afterwards so that you can either watch it again yourself um, if you have uh, additional questions or you can forward that along to, to other people if you wish. So before we get the, the presentation fully underway, I'd like to give a little bit of background about American Bird Conservancy. Our mission is to conserve native birds and their habitats throughout the Americas. And we have a multi-tiered approach for this that's focused on capacity building, protecting habitat, addressing key human-caused threats to birds, and ultimately, of course, preventing bird extinctions. And this requires a variety of approaches, and we work very collaborative, collaboratively on each piece. I'm on the policy and advocacy team um, that, among other things, addresses the threats to birds. Um, and in our team, we also have folks that address window collisions, um, invasive species, and pesticides. And all of this occurs both through work, both on the ground advocacy and on the policy front. And so with that, we'll dive into my program, which is, of course, focused on wind energy. And I, I do want to note at the outset here that this is a, a particularly exciting year for us. Uh, the wind energy program is now in its 10th year. Um, so we've done a lot already to this point and certainly looking forward to continuing to move the ball forward on this in the years to come. And it would help if I could advance my slides just a moment here. There we go. So uh, to provide an overview for the, the wind focus portion of the presentation, um, first we're going to talk a little bit about why we need wind energy. Why do we need renewable energy? Um, then we'll move on to a discussion of renewable energy, um, what that current situation looks like in, term of the, in terms of the amount that's on the ground and also the projections for what that build out is likely to look like moving forward. And then, of course, we'll talk about why wind energy development needs to be bird smart, why that's an issue. We'll move to there, from there to protections for birds as part of this wind energy build out. And then the real meat of the discussion, which is principles for bird smart wind energy. Um, we'll talk a little bit about policy um, that effectively protects birds, and then we will do the question and answer session at the end. So the first question is, why do we need wind energy? Why, why is renewable energy important? And the effects of climate change, needless to say, are going to be extremely far-reaching, and they're going to be very problematic for birds, and not just for birds, but for bats and for other wildlife, in addition, of course, to, to humans. And you could do an entire series of classes on all of these things. So I did just want to start with a very high level look um, and, and really kind of dive into one very recent and, and pretty comprehensive report. Um, this was a study by the Audubon Society, their Survival by Degrees report. And what they essentially did was they looked at uh, more than 600 bird species, primarily in the, the US and Canada. And they looked at their current range as uh, compared to projections for what a bird's range is likely to be under different climate change scenarios in the future. And so as climate changes and as climate warms, um, habitats will be lost, but then on typically the northern end of the range, habitats may be gained, but that's a slower process than the actual habitat loss. And so this shows an example of the, the wood thrush, its current range, and what its range is likely to look like with one and a half degrees Celsius of warming, two degrees Celsius of warming, and three degrees Celsius. And there was a lot of information in the report, but the very high level take home was that they found that 64% of the 604 species in their study were moderately or highly vulnerable to climate change. Obviously, that's a very high proportion. That's a lot of birds. Um, so this just underscores um, how problematic climate change is for bird species. And so in order to minimize the impacts of climate change, 
there's a lot of things that we need to do. Um, we need to do a lot for energy efficiency. We need to do a lot of reforestation um, for carbon sequestration and other purposes. But one of the, one of the, the pieces of a multi-pronged approach to addressing climate change is renewable energy. And this photo just shows a, a fairly idyllic setting where you've got both solar energy and wind energy, which are the, the two most commonly used and, and most widespread of the, the current forms of renewable energy. So looking a little bit at what this build out has looked at has looked like, um, this shows from 2008 to 2018 uh, what the build out has been for both wind energy and solar in the US. Um, on the left, you can see that in 2008, there was already a, a decent amount of wind energy on the ground um, and it grew at a, at a pretty steady clip through 2018. And by all projections, this is likely to continue. So uh, a rapidly growing form of energy. On the right is solar. Um, solar has taken a little bit longer to really take off, but you can see by 2018, that's really starting to increase, um, both in amount and, and rate of growth. Um, and by all projections, solar is going to be moving at a pretty decent clip, particularly when you consider that technological advancements are, are happening all the time for solar. Um, we expect to see a lot of growth in that realm. So taking a look at where wind turbines are currently on the landscape, um, this is from the, the US wind turbine database. And this shows the, the general layout in, with all the, the green blobs on the map here of where wind turbines are currently in the US. And you can see that it's scattered kind of here and there wherever there's wind energy resources in the west, perhaps a little less because solar is, is more attractive there. Not much in the southeast because they just don't have the wind but there's a lot of it in the Great Plains and in portions of the, the Midwest in particular where wind, re, wind resources are, are particularly abundant. And so at this point, we have somewhere um, just over 60,000 turbines um, spread across 41 states in the US. So that's all just what's in the terrestrial landscape, what's on land. There is also offshore buildup that, that is and will be occurring. At this point, there's only a single offshore facility in the U.S., and that's off the coast of Block Island in Rhode Island. It's a, it's a small demonstration project, I think five turbines, um, but as we'll talk about here in just a minute, um, we expect a lot more offshore wind to be coming soon. So again, looking at the, the projections a little bit um, in terms of where we are and where we're going to be going um, with wind energy development, this is um, a little bit outdated at this point. This was a projection from a few years ago um, for how much wind energy we were going to have in the U.S. in 2020. Um, the, the exact layout is, is not exactly right, but um, in terms of the, the amount of capacity that we were predicted to have by, that point, by this point, um, we're pretty much on track to meet that. So that, that prediction was, was very good. Um, this next one is what we expect to see in 2050. So obviously a considerable amount of build out, um, almost four times as much as we have on the ground at the moment. Um, but one thing that's very interesting about this particular figure is the, the, the areas in blue are offshore. So this shows what the projections are for the amount of offshore wind energy development that we're going to have, which by 2050 is anticipated to be quite a bit. Digging a little bit further into the offshore piece, um, this is a, a figure showing the, the different wind area, wind energy areas that are currently being considered in the offshore realm. Um, as you can see, there's quite a bit of it, particularly in the northeastern U.S. Um, Virginia through Massachusetts is, is really the, the sweet spot, um, though also some in the Carolinas. Um, but you can see in the figure on the left there, there's also some areas being considered in, in California and Hawaii as well. Um, we currently have somewhere in the neighborhood of 100 gigawatts of wind energy on the ground in the U.S. Um, one very interesting um, figure is there is currently 25 gigawatts of wind energy being planned in the offshore realm. So almost a quarter of the amount that is already on the ground in the U.S. is, is underway in terms of planning in, in, uh, in the offshore realm, which is really a very rapid buildup. So this is a very rapidly evolving space. So why is it important that wind energy development be bird smart? Well, like many things, um, wind energy is not a perfect solution. Um, there are, American Bird Conservancy estimates that more than half a million birds are killed by turbines in the U.S. every year. 
This is, uh, this is the mortality that comes directly from collisions with wind turbines, um, obviously um, birds having collisions with the wind turbine blades. But it also has to be considered that there's additional sources of mortality associated with wind energy facilities, and one that, that is particularly problematic is from power lines. Power lines are, in their own right, a, a source of mortality for birds, and this comes both from collisions and from electrocutions which, if you combine the two, is somewhere in the neighborhood of 30 million birds a year that are, are killed by power lines. And obviously there's a lot of power lines already on the ground, but it has to be considered that uh, there are a good number of wind energy facilities that are built in areas that are distant from the existing energy grid infrastructure. And so when additional miles of power lines are built to connect new facilities to the grid, that becomes essentially additional mortality associated with that power or with that uh, with that wind energy facility. So, the point of all of that being, the cumulative um, the, the cumulative mortality is more than a half a million birds. Though we don't have a, a strong figure for that. And this mortality, and this is getting back to strictly what the the number of birds that are killed by collisions with the turbines, that's projected to increase to more than 1.4 million birds by 2030. So. Needless to say, this, this is a lot of birds and something that needs to be taken very seriously. So in addition to the mortality piece, there is also a, a habitat loss and, and displacement concern um, with wind energy and birds. So just to highlight a couple of studies that have been done, um, Schaefer and Buell in 2015 uh, published a paper looking at grassland birds in the Dakotas. And they studied nine different species at wind energy facilities before and after the facility was built. And long story short, at the end they found that there were displacement effects for seven of those nine species. And interestingly, those seven species included all of the species of concern that were looked at in, in the study. So um, showed that there were, were fairly substantial effects for, for a lot of those species. Another study in the offshore realm, um, there was a study done, um, this one was 15 years ago in the Baltic Sea looking at water birds. And that's what this figure is on the right that you're looking at, um, the one that looks like it could easily have been drawn by my five-year-old. Um, but this was a radar study that was done primarily on common eiders um, and also on, on um, geese. Um, but this is in the, the marine environment. But the red dots are wind turbines in the offshore realm, and the, the, the black lines are radar studies of the, how the birds moved around them. And you can see it shows a fairly strong pattern of avoidance. Another thing that really needs to be considered in, in all of this is what species are being impacted um, by wind facilities. And some species are, are able to, to, to adapt or to, to deal with wind energy facilities um, than others. Um, and this is a, a table from a, a recent synthesis of the science that was examining the impacts of wind energy build out on wildlife. Um, and this is really just those, it's, this is just species of concerns for which we have scientific evidence that there is a, a, a potential effect. So this is not comprehensive, but it's a, it's a very good overview of, of what we know at this point. And it includes non-bird wildlife. Um, I, I'm not talking about bats today. That's, that's outside of my area of expertise, but it is important to note that the, the impacts to bats are, are actually often more substantial than they are for birds. So very big concern for bats, um, often also marine mammals and reptiles in, in the offshore realm. But in terms of the birds, um, at the top it talks about prairie grouse. This is the, the prairie chicken species and sage grouse. Um, these birds um, have been found to avoid turbines. Um, they actually um, will, will increase the size of their home ranges and there are other effects um, for, for these species. Raptors are a big one. Obviously raptors uh, spend a lot of time on the wing. Um, they're often found in the kinds of habitat that wind energy facilities are built. Um, and so there, it's a large, uh, collisions are, are a very large concern for raptors, and this includes things like eagles and ferruginous and Swainson's hawks. Um, but under the endangered species piece, birds that are very large bodied and have slow reproductive rates are, are particularly um, susceptible to problems from, from wind energy facilities. And this is, you know, the two examples here are California condors and whooping cranes. And for these species, loss of even a single individual is really problematic. So um, again, something that needs to be taken very seriously. So to look a little bit at what the, the underlying current protections are for birds um, from, from a legal standpoint at the federal level, 
we have the Bald and Golden Eagle Protection Act. Um, this is a, a, a law that's been on the books for quite a while. Um, this one does not necessarily serve as a, a huge impediment typically um, for development. Um, there's a, a permitting process that the developer would go through to comply with this act, uh, but it does, um, it does provide protections for our, our two species of eagle in the U.S. We have the, the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. The Migratory Bird Treaty Act is, has been a law in this country for 100 years at this point. Um, and it's one of the, the primary protections for species that are not listed under the Endangered Species Act, um, which is, of course, uh, a, another additional protection for, for birds. But this is just the rarest of the rare. This is just to protect threatened and endangered species. We also have the National Environmental Policy Act, or NEPA, um, which really, that, that governs more the, the, the process of assessing the likely environmental impacts of a project. And so this has more to do with the actual planning aspects. And one very important thing to note is, of course, we are going through uh, an era right now on, of unprecedented environmental regulatory rollback. Um, the, the laws that are highlighted here in red, um, there are, are, are currently efforts being made at the federal level to, um, to really weaken the, the enforcement or the intent of, of these different laws. Um, Bald and Golden Eagle Protection Act is not highlighted, but there are rumors that um, that if that is coming. Um, we also have, in addition to the federal laws, we have state and local regulations. Um, these are not really, um, this is not something that's going to be the same from one, from one jurisdiction to the next. Um, some states have, have very strong laws, some local jurisdictions do. Um, some have very minimal laws um, that really govern wind energy siting. And this figure really kind of shows that a little bit. Um, what this shows is in green, um, these, these are areas where wind energy, wind energy permitting is governed by the local government, the yellow is by the state government, and the blue is split authority. Um, so again, what this really shows is there's very little consistency across the country in terms of how these are permitted, how they're regulated, and at the end of the day, um, unless there is a federal nexus, the federal government really does not provide um, any, any oversight necessarily. This is um, just a look at the cover of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service land-based wind energy guidelines. Um, this was published in 2012. This was actually a, a, a really impressive effort led by the Fish and Wildlife Service. They had everybody at the table from federal agencies, to wind energy development companies, to environmental NGOs, and really hash through what are the best practices for siting a wind energy facility in such a way that it is likely to avoid the, the, the greatest risks to, to birds and other wildlife. And there's a lot of good information in here, um, and, and this really does, it, it can do a very effective job of, of siting for wind energy facilities. Um, but, um, and this is a big but, um, this was made voluntary. So it was decided that these were not going to be mandatory guidelines. And so one of the unfortunate side effects of that is that there was really no way to understand what the effectiveness or compliance was um, with regard to the actual outcomes on the ground um, until fairly recently. And this is a, a figure from a report by the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies that came out late this year. Um, this actually is um, just one question that was asked in a questionnaire of state fish and wildlife biologists asking how effective do you think the federal wind energy guidelines are at supporting low impact wind siting? Um, and at the end of the day, where you put the facility is enormously important um, in terms of the impact it's likely to have. And what this shows is that uh, half of the people found that the, the wind energy guidelines were somewhat effective at, at at uh, moving wind energy facilities toward, toward low risk sites, and 30% said not very effective, and then you had about 3% each for very effective and not at all effective. So this outcome could have been worse. Um, it certainly could have been a lot better. Again, this is a, a critically important element of actually getting wind energy projects on the ground in terms of minimizing the effects to wildlife. So, we need, we need renewable energy to minimize the effects of climate change. This is very clear. But it's also very clear that wind turbines are a threat to birds. So the question is, where does that leave you? And our solution is bird smart wind energy. 
So one very important take home today is American Bird Conservancy strongly supports wind energy development, but it has to be bird smart. And so what does that look like? And that means following seven principles of bird smart wind energy. And I'm not going to read through these. I'll, I'll go through these kind of step by step. But again, this is our vision for how a wind energy facility can actually get on the ground while still protecting birds effectively. The first one of these is you have to evaluate the likely impacts of a facility on birds. <clears throat> and this really starts with a desktop study. And we're, we're, we're really blessed to be in an era where there's a ton of information about birds online. If you've ever gotten on eBird um, as a birder, I could spend hours on eBird. Um, there's, um, there's a lot of good reports out there. Um, every state has a wildlife action plan that has a lot of good information. Um, but not just the, the online data and resources that way, there's a lot of good local resources in, in, in terms of local expertise. Um, folks can reach out to their state fish and wildlife biologists, their district biologists. Um, there may be people at a, a local academic institution that have a lot of, a lot of expertise. But at the end of the day, what, what you're really looking for here is red flags. And you're not necessarily going to get that from the desktop study, but what you're looking for is things like large concentrations of birds. You're looking for the presence of rare species, um, trying to figure out if it's a, a major migratory stopover. There's, there's a number of things that you're looking for, but the intent is to try to identify those red flags for a property as quickly as possible so that you might say, hey, you know what, this one might be really problematic. Maybe we should walk away and find a different place for this. So once you've gotten to a point where you say, okay, this, this property might work for a wind facility, it's critically important that you get out there and actually do a study on the ground. Um, it, really, it, it, it would be a really rare scenario where there's enough information already available to say, okay, we know enough to move forward on. Almost every time you're going to have to go out there and get site-specific data, and this is going to have to look at birds across the year. Um, if you just look at breeding birds, you may miss a, a bird that's there in the wintertime or during migration um, that, that needs to be accounted for. Um, so uh, across the year, you need to get an appropriate number of years of data. But at the end of the day, uh, enough information needs to be collected to, to really evaluate what that bird population looks like across the year and, and be sure that any, any potential red flags are accounted for. In the offshore realm, um, this, this looks a little different. Um, again, this, this industry is a little bit newer than the onshore, and this is really more of an agency-led process. Um, in particular, the, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service are really getting out ahead of this and collecting a lot of the data that's necessary to inform appropriate siting. And then a lot of the states, particularly in the Northeast, are, are taking a very proactive approach to make sure that all of these things are understood, all of these things are accounted for, and everything is, is really incorporated effectively in the planning process. So all of this is to say that it's very important to do comprehensive research prior to committing to a property because the farther along the process a given project goes, when a, when a red flag is found, the harder it gets for a company to actually turn around and say, you know what, maybe we should look for a better spot. And one very important thing to consider is that once you understand the effects of a given, uh, what the impacts might be on a given site, it's very important to consider cumulative impacts. If it's, if it's going to be the only facility within 500 miles, you pretty much understand that by looking at your project. If there's a whole lot of wind development being um, put in in that area or within that flyway, it's very, very important to look at the cumulative impacts and kind of say, okay, when you look at the big picture, when you look at all of these facilities, what is the total impact and is that problematic? So to inform uh, the process of making sure to site uh, facilities in the right place, we've developed what we call the wind risk assessment map, and this is just a, a screenshot here. Um, one thing to note, we are in the process of updating our wind risk assessment map. Um, this is going to be in a uh, newer and uh, more user-friendly platform. We actually expect to be releasing that within the next week. But what the map shows here are, are different areas of potential concern for birds. Um, Color-coded, obviously, red are the areas that are of the higher concern. These are areas that, again, might have very high concentrations. Um, these are national wildlife refuges. These are uh, American Bird Conservancy-designated important bird areas. 
So those are areas that are either best avoided or approached with extreme caution with the understanding that any developments in those areas are probably going to have a higher risk of not proving to be feasible um, as, a, as a site or require extraordinary mitigation and minimization measures to, to actually make them work. Um, the orange areas, um, these, there, there are different purposes for the orange areas. The, the, the solid orange, again, some of, uh, some of these important bird areas um, and other areas of importance to birds. Um, and again, these are areas that, that somebody, if they were looking at a facility in one of those areas, would really have to do their homework. Slightly less risk level, um, certainly, than the red. Um, but again, someone would have to look very, very closely and proceed with caution in those areas. And then in the, the kind of washed out orange areas, there's a, there's a lot of different information that underlies those, and all of that information is available on our wind risk assessment map. But if you look, for example, at that, that stripe running right down through the middle of the country, that is the, the, the migratory pathway of the whooping crane. So this map is not to say that you can't put any wind energy developments in that pathway. Um, it, it goes without saying from having looked at the earlier figure, there, there is wind energy in that pathway. But when someone visits this site and says, hey, we're thinking about putting a facility in there, they take a look and they say, hey, we need to think about whooping cranes. Uh, we have similar um, polygons in here for sage grouse, for eagles, and for other species as well. But again, this is just a resource that we've made available to inform this process. So the second, um, the second principle of bird smart wind energy and what the, all of this is really building up to is that turbines are sited in low risk areas. And again, that's critically important. If you don't put it in a low risk area, it's gonna be nearly impossible to keep the, the impacts to birds at an acceptable level. So it's very, very important to do the homework and get it in the right spot. Okay. So one example that I'll give here um, is the Icebreaker Wind Project. Um, this, is, this, um, this is intended to be a, a small number of turbines off the coast of Cleveland. Um, this is a, a precedent-setting project that's been proposed. Um, this would be the, the first offshore wind facility in the Great Lakes. Um, and it's in a globally important bird area as designated by um, the Audubon Society. And the reason it was designated that is because there's a, there's a, a good amount of data, um, a lot of it from the Ohio Department of Natural Resources, that shows that not only the, the shoreline, but also the, the central basin of Lake Erie is used by a very large number of birds. And this is things like waterfowl that will migrate along the lake, um, they'll winter again in the central basin, but you've also got flocks of songbirds um, that will actually do nocturnal migratory flights over the lake. So they're actually, they, they do the leap at night. And so for, for any of those groups, at different points, they could be at risk of collision with those turbines, um, particularly the, the songbirds that are, are flying at night. Um, so from, from our perspective, this project needs to proceed with absolutely extreme caution. Um, it's been, it's been under, the, the planning has been underway for, for many years at this point. And it was actually very recently um, pretty much proceeding toward approval. And in our view, um, this project has not done principle number one of bird smart wind energy effectively at all. Um, when they were going through the, the NEPA process, they did a, a more cursory environmental assessment, um, which really does not go into the depth that one would need for a precedent setting project in an area that is of this level of importance to birds. And an environmental impact statement was, was clearly needed um, in our view. Um, throughout the process, they, they tended to rely on science that was not as effective in, in really looking at what the, the, A, where the birds were and, and how they were moving, but also what that likely impact was going to be to those birds. Um, and at the end of the day, they, they said that this is only one project. Um, there's really no need to assess cumulative impacts. Um, we disagree um, because this project has been very, um, very vocally a, a demonstration project that would open the gateway for a considerable amount of additional offshore, offshore development in Lake Erie and, and elsewhere in the Great Lakes. So we think it's very important to consider what that cumulative impact would look like. And so we did at the end of last year in conjunction with Black Swamp Bird Observatory file a lawsuit um, against this project. 
really just contending that they hadn't they hadn't really done their homework. And again, that's what the the first principle of Bird Smart Wind Energy is, and it's very important. And in this very very important case, um, we felt that they did uh, a poor job. So looking forward to the, the post-construction monitoring. So once a, an appropriate site has been developed that, that really keeps the risk to, to birds at a low level, um, it's really important afterwards to say, okay, did we site this right? Is this working the way that we expected it to in terms of the, the impacts on birds? And this requires some form of, of post-construction mortality monitoring. And this information is really critical to inform adaptive management. Again, it's, it's all fine and well to say this is what we think is going to happen, but you actually have to get out and, and make sure that that is what's happening. On the land, this actually entails carcass surveys. And this, in, this is somebody, uh, a, a surveyor goes out um, on a regular basis, and they're actually walking within a radius of each turbine um, or a subset of turbines, and they're looking for bird carcasses um, to see what's actually been killed. Um, this has been a, a process that's been going on for many years at this point. Um, the, the methods have been refined over the years. Um, but one thing that's been very interesting recently is that some studies have shown that the, the actual, um, the, the collection and detection of these carcasses improves dramatically with the assistance of survey dogs. Um, perhaps not a not a surprise when when someone points it out, but it took a while for somebody to think of that. So um, that should continue to evolve, and it is very likely that survey dogs will will continue to be used more and more moving forward. And looking at post construction uh, mortality monitoring in the offshore realm, obviously it's a lot more difficult when your your turbine is above water. Um, when a bird's struck by a turbine, um, it's going to float away or sink, but one way or the other, um, it's not going to be detectable. So this is going to entail um, more of, of a technological approach. And there are various forms of technology that have been um, deployed at this point. Um, there are cameras that can be used. There's what is kind of snarkily referred to as a thunk meter that detects the, the actual collision itself um, and, and various pairings of that technology. But at the end of the day, there, there isn't a, a really solid method for not only detecting a bird collision with, with an offshore turbine, but knowing what that bird was. And that obviously does matter quite a bit, whether you're, whether it's the most common gull or, um, or whether it's a roseate turn that's been killed. But one way or the other, very important to, to gather that data for adaptive management. So a very, another important aspect um, is to incorporate appropriate minimization measures in a given project. And there are different ways that this can be this can be done. Um, the really broad brushstroke um, is temporal cur curtailment. Um, curtailment essentially meaning you shut the turbines off. The, you don't allow the turbines to turn. And temporal curtailment is essentially shutting the turbines off for a given time of the day, given time of the year, when you know that there is going to be risk. And, and for example. Um, that was something that we were pushing for in a project in Humboldt County, California recently, where marble murrelets were going to be making transit um, to and from the, the forest, between the forest and the ocean, to deliver uh, fish to their nestlings. There's a, a fairly specific period of the, the day that those birds are moving, and so the suggestion was to curtail the turbines during the period that they were making those, those transitory flights. Um, but again, very broad brushstroke. Then you get into smart curtailment, and smart curtailment is curtailment that's informed by real-time information. And the, the photo here is an Identiflight tower. Identiflight is a, a very exciting technology that's, that's starting to be deployed, and this uses artificial intelligence and, and machine learning essentially to learn the, 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 the appearance and the flight patterns of specific species of birds which then allow an alert to be sent that allows facility managers to, to curtail the turbines. And what it is successful for at this point that we do know is golden eagles, um, golden eagles being one of the species that, that wind turbines are particularly problematic for. Um, and this is now currently um, deployed at almost 10 facilities, I think, in the U.S., um, but allows them to detect eagles out to one kilometer and then again send the signal that allows the facility managers to shut the turbines down. This is, um, generally speaking, technology is a, a very rapidly um, evolving area um, in terms of research and development, and 
um, we certainly look forward to seeing a lot more of this kind of stuff moving forward. Um, other methods for minimization measures are things like diverters and, and deterrents. Um, the idea here um, is to actually try to prevent a bird from approaching a wind turbine. And they, these take various forms, but um, one kind of interesting thing about turbines, um, since, as you can see in this photo, um, in many cases they're in wide open spaces, they look from a distance like a really good perch site. So if you happen to be a red-tailed hawk or a Swainson's hawk or a prairie falcon, you might look at this turbine and say, hey, that'd be a really fantastic place to go perch while, while I'm searching for prey. And so part of the idea is how to keep them from, from looking attractive as a, a potential perch site for, for one of these birds that might um, otherwise come in contact with the turbine blades. Um, as far as minimization measures go, Looking at the power line piece, um, the Avian Power Line Interaction Committee has developed some really great guidelines for how to minimize the impacts of the, the, the power lines and, and how, what best management practices are for that. Um, this includes things like in, in very high risk areas for power line collision, actually burying the cables. Um, you know, that one's fairly obvious, but um, these are great guidelines and, and very helpful and something that we, we certainly encourage developers to use. And again, at, at the end of the day, very important that all of this be managed on an adaptive basis. So if you have, a, so once you've got a project, if there are still unavoidable impacts, even with your minimization measures, which is, which is basically invariably the case, it's important to, to mitigate or, or compensate for that loss. Um, that loss is, of course, both the, uh, both the mortality piece, um, but also the loss of habitat. Um, Mitigation can look a, a variety of ways. Um, habitat restoration, obviously, um, is something that, that's very effective, or acquisition or, or other modes of protection for offsite habitat. Um, you know, it, mitigation for in, in other realms in the environment, like wetland impacts, the, that kind of thing. Um, it's, it's often historically been the case that um, regulators wish you to, to do the mitigation on site and in kind. That can be pretty difficult um, when you're putting turbines on the landscape, so off-site um, is, is certainly pretty sensible in a lot of places. Um, but also addressing threats, you know, a, other basic conservation measures like um, minimizing the effects of predators or, or whatever happens to be the threat for a given species. And at the end of the day, the intent of this is to produce more birds, to ensure that once everything is all said and done, you've got more of the species that are being impacted than there were when you started with. It's, it's not a, a net loss. Um, in the offshore realm, mitigation is um, a bit, it can be a bit difficult. Um, so one thing that gets discussed a lot is mitigation funds, and this is essentially putting together a bank of funds to um, actually put some of these conservation measures in place, uh, and again, with the intent of having a, a net benefit standard. So at the end of the day, your wind facility, um, they're, they're often on a 30-year lease, and then you have a, a facility that is no longer in use potentially, and there's a, a lot of infrastructure on the landscape. So part of Bird Smart Wind Energy is to make sure that these are decommissioned, and that entails removing all of the infrastructure um, and, very importantly, restoring it when it's done. One important thing to note is that the wind energy facilities do actually tend to cover in terms of the developed area somewhere in the neighborhood of 5 or 10 percent of a, of a property. Um, but this is spread over a relatively large area which fragments the landscape which is, which is not necessarily good for birds. These photos here show a little bit of what that looks like. The photo on the right in particular, you can see that that's in a landscape that's otherwise largely forested. And perhaps that was an existing road, perhaps not, but you can see how that fragments what was otherwise a fairly contiguous patch of forest. So when you start one of these projects and recognizing that this doesn't necessarily follow chronologically, but when someone is saying, okay, we need renewable energy, before you get to the point where you say, all right, it should be wind, it's very important to say, okay, what are all of our options and what makes the most sense for the area that we're considering? And from a cost perspective, and I, and I recognize this figure is a bit busy, but this shows from 2009 to 2019 what the, the levelized costs are of various forms of, of energy generation. And the, the, really, the really important take-home message, if you look in the very bottom right there, 
it shows that at $41 and $41 respectively, you have wind energy and solar. And so essentially, not only are these forms of energy, it, it, forms of energy extremely competitive just on a broader market scale, they're very competitive with each other. And if you look, the, the yellow is solar, and it has had the, the steepest decline over this time period um, and is becoming very competitive and, and likely to be more so moving forward. So obviously solar is a very, a very um, attractive option. We also want to make a plug for distributed solar. And this is solar that is going to be on the rooftops of homes or box stores. Um, it can go in brownfields or degraded sites. Um, there's some exciting work with agricultural integration, figuring out how to both grow crops and have solar panels. Um, but this is a very, this is a form of solar energy that has very, very low impact for birds. And we very much um, are advocates for maxing this out um, in, any, in, area, in any area where that's possible. There's also a lot of emerging technology in terms of other ways to generate energy from the wind. Um, the one we've got here on the left is Makani Kites. Um, when I first looked at this, I thought it looked like a model airplane. Um, the photo at the bottom shows that these are actually uh, considerably larger structures, but these are tethered and actually um, they are sort of released almost like a kite um, on this tether until they reach the wind and then they do kind of looping flights that generates electricity. And interestingly, one of these generates a, a fair amount of electricity um, as compared to turbines. Um, on the right, this is called Vortex, and Vortex is actually a bladeless system. This is another one that's under development, but this is just to show that there's a lot of research and development that needs to happen, and there's some really good outside-of-the-box thinking that, that can help to, to minimize impacts moving forward. I'm going to talk a little bit here about BirdSmart policy. Um, there's a few, um, a few bills um, that are being considered in Congress right now that, that um, affect birds in this world one way or the other. Um, one very positive development is the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, I'm sorry, the Migratory Bird Protection Act um, that was introduced late last year. And this is essentially to strengthen the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, which we talked about earlier, um, which is currently being undermined um, in terms of its effect and enforcement at the federal level. And among other things, this requires industries to adhere to best management practices. And of course, we've got the wind energy guidelines, um, which I talked about earlier. Um, solar would have a little more time since they don't have those best practices developed. But um, at this point, this has been introduced and has passed the committee. Um, and we are, very, um, we are very hopeful that this will be ultimately be passed. This is an action alert you can, you can actually take when you get, if you get on our website, um, if you'd like to voice your support for that. And this would generate uh, a, a note to your members of Congress asking them to support the act. There's also a few bills that we've been watching that we're not as excited about. Um, most of these have to do with um, actually siting wind energy facilities on public lands. And when you think about siting these on public lands, um, the hope would be that this would set a higher bar. Um, but in fact, um, unfortunately, um, it, it is actually quite the opposite. Um, for one, um, HR 3794, um, there's actually a NEPA exclusion. It actually makes it easier to get through the NEPA process um, and, and avoids the need for that individual site level assessment, which I talked about being is so important. Um, there is a fund that this would, would ultimately put money into, um, but there's a loophole in, in the mitigation fund in that it could actually go for recreational development and at the end of the day really just does not take care of birds very well. Um, we've also got an action alert for that one, um, which again, you can find on our website if you want to voice your support. Um, ask your congressperson to support Bird Smart Wind Energy and make some positive changes in these bills. So looking ahead for the program, um, we're going to be soon releasing a report on conserving birds and halting climate change. That should be out in the next couple of months. Um, I mentioned the updated wind risk assessment map. And in the next month or so, um, we'll have the inaugural Bird Smart Wind Energy newsletter, so do be looking for that. Um, with that, this is my contact information. Um, please feel free to reach out to me at any point if you've got questions. Um, and with that, I am happy to take questions. That is going to